welcome to our Accountants Empire Masterclass CEO live show. My name is Paul Jant, and thanks for joining us today. Look, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. You're in for a bit of a treat today. If you are returning, thank you for coming back. We've got one of the heavyweights. I'll call him one of the heavyweights. He might not like that, but he's, we've got one of the heavyweights of our accounting industry joining us today, and that's Andrew Conway. Now, we are here thanks to the Professional Partners Education and our amazing supporters in Hall, Chadwick, Profit Master, iKeep, and Lloyd's Auctioneers. Now, the great part about this is, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had a bit of pleasure. And for those of you that are joining us today, this week we ran a really cool little lunch. So I've spent a bit of time with a lot of accounting firms only earlier today as a part of our Hall Chadwick partners and one of our Lloyds, one of our sponsors, uh, Lloyd Steve Sarkis was there as well. And we had our Melbourne accounting networking lunch earlier this week. Oh, I can't even know, don't even know which day of the week it is, Tuesday. Um, we had it at Movita. So look, again, I don't know if you guys have been there before, Andrew, I don't know if you've been there before, but geez, what a, what a great place, what some great food. So to all of you that joined us on Tuesday and are online again, thank you. Um, a massive shout out to Danielle Morrison. Danny does a great job as a part of the whole Chadwick group as well to get all the firms as a part of our accounting network together. So it was a great little session. Just a little bit about professional partners education, if you are new and you're not exactly quite sure. So this is about us giving a little bit back to you. So we're giving back to the industry. It's to continually provide a, let's call it a platform of learning, educational content, whether that be through our live shows like this is today, whether it's being through our podcasts, um, you know, we've got our, um, our Empire podcast, we've got our Drive Time podcast. It's all about just continually providing educational content. And I would say non-technical educational content. So it's for you, with, if you're the partner, it could be for your staff, you know, whether you've got three or whether you've got 53, it really doesn't matter. But this is all about ideally providing you guys with a bit of a platform for continuous learning. CPD, no doubt about it. If you've missed anything that we've done in the past, all our previous shows, they're all on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and type in Professional Partners Education, subscribe and the content will just be delivered to you. But all of our past shows, it's all there as well. Now, as more of you join, which is fantastic, we do have the Q&A bar set up as well. So if you've got questions, we will have time for questions with Andrew later on as we get through, sort of as we're 40, 55 minutes in, there's definitely be question time there. So please feel any comments or any questions, drop them into the chat bar because that's going to be important. Now, today we get to hear from, as I sort of mentioned before, we get to hear from one of our industry leaders. We know we've only got three governing bodies and today we have the pleasure in chatting, you, know, you listening and me chatting to one of, our, one of our leaders. It's the Institute of Public Accountants Group CEO. His name's Andrew Conway. Andrew, I know we were chatting just for a couple of minutes just before then, but Mate, welcome to our Empire Masterclass CEO series. It's been a while since we've spoken. No, thanks, Paul. Good to be with you. And, and thanks to the professional partners education and, and also to Paul Chadwick. I think it's good to be having these conversations and it's good to uh, to interact with the people that are joining today and, and equally for those who'll be perhaps watching a recording, also happy to engage uh, offline as well. But no, great to be chatting as always, Paul. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks. And you, you were saying before, it's a funny thing. We've all started to let's call it, we've all started to travel again. And mm. um, if it's not, the amount of people that seem to be in Europe or Bali is ridiculous. But I know you were just mentioning before that you've been travelling around the country as well. Um, mm. Mate, how, how's all that been for you since we've been reconnecting with probably some of your offices? Yeah, look, it's been really good. I mean, getting around our divisions uh, over the last week or so has been, been really important for us. I mean, we, we do try and uh, get around as much as we possibly can. Obviously, that's for, for everyone that's been really challenging more recently. Uh, but just in the last few days, just getting some good member engagement. I mean, I try and attend every uh, divisional advisory committee meeting personally and, and hear directly from members about the issues they're facing. It's fair to say, you know, members are pretty well exhausted um, after the last couple of years. We don't have to look too far around the profession to see that. Um, but there's a sense of optimism, uh, you know, there's a bit of that, you know, what's to come yet with the federal budget just around the corner in October, uh, what's that going to mean for us? So there's a, you know, th there's a lot of change on the radar as well, but, you know, the sense of engagement is very strong. And I, I just, frankly, just love getting out and engaging with, uh, with members I, you know, have done since so, have done so since I got into this role and I uh, don't hesitate in sharing my mobile number to any member who, who needs access and wants to have a chat at any time on any issue. It's uh, I think the last thing professional bodies need to be, and that's uh, 
distance from members. I mean, if you, if you lose connection with members, I'd ask, what are you there for? That's a very good point. And I think that's one of the great things that, you know, probably over the last two or three years when you've always given us time um, and to be a part of, you know, sort of front and centre. And the one thing you talk about is your members. And I think you, you, you're 100% right. If, you, if you're not accessible, um, what's the point of being in the role? So it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And you, you guys have always got great data as well that you feed back to a lot of the members in the industry as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, I think the the other interesting aspect on engagement with members is that some I think it can be overcomplicated a little bit. You know, what I I see the the, the role and the function. You know, engage with members, hear what the issues are from the conference. We, we might think we have an idea from a professional body point of view. We're not the ones out there doing tax returns and engaging with clients every day. It, that that comes from the membership. So getting that real first hand perspective is so important. And, and why one we can change our education products and and services, but but secondly and perhaps most importantly. When we go and talk to Canberra and speak to policymakers and legislators, you can actually have a conversation and say, look, here's actually a real world example that our members are facing and, and here is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I, I just reckon that's so crucial when it comes to government relations and advocacy to have that member perspective. So um, I, I said to any member of any professional association, you know, lean in and have the conversation. And if you're not getting the response you want from your professional body or, or you're not feeling as though you're being heard, uh, I, for me, I, I'd be challenging the whole construct of why I'm a member. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's really important. That engagement is absolutely critical. Yeah, good, mate. Good. And, it, and it's, it's, it's great to see, you know, we've been through, and you sort of mentioned before, uh, you know, a couple of tough years. Yeah. Um, members are tired. Firms are busier than ever. I know even at our lunch, it was great to have, I think we had 29, 30 firms at the lunch on Tuesday, which was fantastic. But, you know, firms are saying, yeah, look, they're, they're, they're really under the pump and they're fairly busy. Now, let's talk about from your point of view, the let's get a bit of a thought process from your perspective to where you feel the profession in the industry is at. A um, bit of a foresight and maybe a vision to where you think it is and where we're heading. Look, I, I think there's an aspect of change fatigue really that's around and if we look around um whether it's members in practice members in commerce or it doesn't really matter which uh, specialty you have in the profession there's been so much change that's taken place now we've always dealt with change but i'd struggle i i don't know that we've ever dealt with the velocity of change that we're experiencing right now uh, and so our pitch from an institute perspective to government is just be aware of that be, if you want to take practitioners with you on whatever change you're wanting to make, and whether it's a you know a, a policy statement or a discussion paper on Section 100A, whether it's a quality quality of advice review, whether it's changes to whatever requirements different regulators have, just just have in mind that people that are needing to action these changes are still running businesses and have had a really tough time over the last couple of years. Now, don't get me wrong, when I say tough time, there have been certainly plenty of practitioners who have done very well. Mm. Um, but they've done well, probably at their own personal expense in terms of their own, you know, their own sanity in some cases, their own life, lifestyles and, and the fact they've been working, uh, you know, seven days a week for the last two plus years. Now, some experienced practitioners say, well, we've always done that. And, and I, I get that. But it has, it's been incredibly intense. So what we say is, I think that's, that first aspect sort of mega trend is just trying to be aware of the velocity of change that practitioners are having to face. And, and professional bodies have got a role in that as well. So when we introduce professional standards, being aware of that impact. I think also um, you, you can't turn anywhere in the profession without conversations about sustainability and the impact of sustainability standards. Um, happy to delve into as much or as little as that as you like, Paul. But this is going to have a profound impact on the way we operate as a profession. Now, I've just spoken about change. This is a change that has been a long time coming in a sense. We started with things like triple bottom line that sort of came and it went. Uh, we then had, of course, the integrated reporting framework, which was uh, which has been the genesis of sustainability standards. But you got now got an international sustainability standards board. Um, we met with them uh, in in London just uh, just a few weeks ago now, hearing directly from the uh, executive director of the IWSB or the IFRS Foundation about what's happening there. It is happening at a really rapid rate. Um, you know, the, their expectation is that we'll have a, a globally converged set of standards to use uh, for reporting season 24, 25. Now that's, like, that's staggeringly fast. Mm. And you think about 
educators aren't ready for that. Um, you know, there's no course of accounting around Australia, let alone the world, that actually has embedded sustainability standards. Why? Because the standards are still in exposure draft at the moment. So we're going to have to be very, very quick off the mark to get this stuff moving and then building assurance practices around that. So when the standards are starting to be used. So there's sustainability. An extension of that is ESG and the role the profession plays in, in ESG. Again, happy, happy to delve into that. And then there's this sense, of, I think, around just the ongoing role of, of technology and its impact on us as a profession. But the final point I make is, is around you know, rounding out the piece on, on wellbeing and mental health. There's, mm -hmm. there's a lot in that that we have, you know, thankfully, we certainly opened up the discussion on as an institute back in 2018. Yes. And we've had some really strong success in relation to rolling out programs of support. Again, there's there's been a lot of movement there. So this is sort of a sense as to where we we see things heading at the moment. Yeah, good. Well, we're, we're going to unpack a little bit of that because I think to all of you that are watching this or listening maybe, depending on what mode you're in, um, we, we're going to delve a little bit into exactly the ESG. We're going to delve a little bit into the mental health aspects and the counting on you programs. I know we spoke about that maybe two and a half years ago, maybe. We're going to we're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, so, mate, let's let's kick off. You you know you mentioned sustainability. Let's talk about ESG. Um, you know that was a so the words environmental social governance. Let's talk about that for a second and tell tell our listeners, I suppose, and share with me what what does it mean, um, and how do we move? How are we moving towards that as we move? Well, it's scary to think we're closer to the twenty three calendar year than the other way. You know. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I look at the ESG conversation in two frames. One is the, the role of, um, yeah, the, the impact on accountability and then the role of leadership. So in, in, in the ESG space, we think about, well, what role do we have to enhance transparency and accountability of organisations in terms of the use of resource, um, the impact on society, you know, the environmental impact, um, and then what sort of governance and, and frameworks does the organization have? And, and those arrangements really should be transparent for all and sundry. So we actually get a chance to see how an organization doesn't just talk about these things, how does it genuinely deliver? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing, for example, um, to uh, at, an, at an event that you're running or a meeting you're running uh, within your organization is to do an acknowledgement of country, um, it's another thing to have an integrated reconciliation action plan that actually holds people accountable for, for generating change. Uh, so, they, so in some ways, there's subtle differences in terms of you know um, environmental, social, and governance. But but the but the role we have is, is how do we as a profession shine a light on those aspects? So, for us specifically and technically, it will be about how we're reporting on that information and, and data. How do we get layers of assurance over those reports? And encourage that sort of sense of adoption of an ES, of ESG practices, and it doesn't need to be um, big ticket items initially. Um, starting somewhere, starting small, you know, it, it could be an awareness of just waste management practices in an office. It could be, an, you know, really, really small steps that then build momentum around the importance of ESG. Um, that that's on the accountability front, and then encouraging staff, of course, to hold the organisation accountable as well. In a professional association, we'd say, well, we'd want members to hold us accountable also. So if you turn up to an, an event, um, what sort of impacts have we had on society and, and environment we're operating? On the leadership side, you know, the profession has a really unique position as trusted advisors. And, you know, within the IPA network, we've got more than 5,000 accounting practices in Australia alone and another couple of thousand in the UK. Our view is if we can encourage these conversations through our members to be having that with their clients, that's a really important leadership position to take. Yep. And you get that sort of ripple effect across Correct. society. And um, and that doesn't mean that the accounting profession is necessarily going to result in, um, it is going to deliver, uh, you know, a, a carbon neutral, uh, you know, and, and, and significant reductions in pollution right across the globe, but every little bit helps. Mm. And when you engage with students, I mean, we had a, um, uh, we facilitated together with Monash University and the UN just two weeks ago, um, a UN Sustainable Futures Challenge at Monash, where a whole group of students, for, and they did it for credit, part of their course, came together in a project approach to solve real world problems. The client in this uh, scenario was the UN, um, to solve real world scenarios for the UN. 
and the insight those students go through that sustainability challenge. Like I went to the pitch sessions and I came out, um, yeah, it, it was the goosebump stuff because the the passion that the students put into their to their proposals and the focus they bring was just really heartening. So this is the language that our accounting leaders of, of today and tomorrow need to be talking about. And I certainly see it with students talking about it. This is what lights them up. You know, the, the research shows that a student in accounting at the moment is not so much focused on what they're going to be paid. They are now focused on what social impact they're going to have. And, and we as a profession have got to do better at joining the dots about the role that we play in achieving those outcomes as a profession. It goes well beyond the numbers and everything to do with community impact. Yeah, brilliant. And I, and I think that was even reflective in our more recent federal election as well, that the, the young people were having a voice of the, you know, things like environmental as a classic example. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's not, you know, I've had some skeptics say to me, oh, well, you know, this is, this, you know, on things like sustainability standards, oh, here we go, just triple bottom line again, bit of greenwashing. This ain't going away. And, and when you talk to banks in Australia, banks are already asking SMEs for some of this information. And, and this will be a, a critical aspect of access to capital, in my view, that SMEs will need to be able to demonstrate what sort of impact they're having on, on the society and community within which they're operating. Doesn't mean they're going to need to produce these you know, long and extensive online reports about their, you know, their sustainable practices, but there will be core information that will be sought by banks. And you say, well, why would the banks be asking? It's because the shareholders of the banks are expecting them to be asking the questions. Yes. Interesting. Um, so if you were to, you know, to share with our firms online, and, and you sort of mentioned something before with regard to just waste, and what, what's something that firms could start doing? Is this something that when you're talking about environmental, social or governance, um, that in, that in that sustainability space, what, what's one thing that they could start having as a part of their strategic plan, operational plan moving forward? I'd, I'd be saying first and foremost, it, it should be an agenda item at a partners meeting, full stop. Okay. Uh, it, it has to be led. And in our case, it was led by our board uh, and it, our, our group executive. It's got to be led from management and, and the board. So you've got to have that governance focus on it first. So that would, I'd say I'd be adding it to first and foremost to an agenda saying, what does this mean for us? Because yes. it's highly contextualized. I mean, you've got to say, well, what does it mean for the, the practice that we're in or the practice we're operating for our people? And then once you've identified what it is you're wanting to do, engaging with your team about it, That's helping nice. the team to define, do a co-design of what does sustainability practice mean for us or our ESG focus mean for us? Uh, how do we practice diversity and inclusion and, and start those conversations? Now, again, they are, you know, once upon a time, I think there were some who might have criticised that as just being a bit warm and fuzzy. It genuinely is what people are focused on. And whether that's a construct of COVID, whether it's just the changing generations or it is the way in which business should be offered. And we've got a, a role to play in leading that. So it's got to start with leadership. And then there are plenty of tools available. And we, we for example, um, we have members say to us as well, which is we're interested in finding out more about this. So we actually established um, a sustainability discussion group for members to share their ideas about what they're doing in their practices. Now, those discussion groups aren't... Um, just specific to IPA members. I'm sure the other bodies do the same thing. You know, getting together once a month to say, look, here's, here's a, a guest speaker on, on sustainable practices in your business, some small tips you can use. We've got some stuff on our website as well about that. But you know, engaging with each other um, about what can work for your, for your business. There's not sort of a one size fits all, fits all approach, but the, the one thing that's common is just starting the conversation. Yes. I think that's the great thing. You know, when you think about, I know we've often spoken about our, our, our kids and our, our kids are leading a lot of this, you know, like I've got three boys, you know, so it's a, the, the, what comes back from the schools is leading a lot of that as well, which then you can take into the workplace or some of the firms will probably have, they may have some older children, but they've probably got kids at university as well. So again, there's no reason why if you're not sure as a leader or a partner in a firm, which way to go go to your people and ask them. There's nothing wrong in setting up a quick think tank and just talking about it. You know, one of the, um, we've got a sustainable a sustainability policy advisor we're fortunate to have is a, a relatively recent university graduate and the insight that he's brought to the table is just fantastic. And so he's, he's genuinely challenged us in many ways about uh, our practices, which is excellent. Um, and, and I appreciate not every organisation or practice is going to have the ability to go and source a, a sustainability advisor. Um, 
but, uh, but you've got some of these questions or conversations you start to have are pretty standard conversations about, you know, what sort of impact are we actually having? And what are our people expecting of us? And it's, and when you have that conversation, it, it takes you in different directions. You'd be surprised where it can lead you. Um, so I, I just think, you know, society is expecting us to do it. Um, it's not necessarily the safe space that accounting has always operated in. Um, but, you know, if we come back to that notion of what sort of value we're we giving to our community, I think it's really important for us to lead that. Yeah, I'd agree. And look, and we're going to talk about people soon, but I think um, even when we talk about that, when we get to that, the, the thought process to leaders and partners listening to this is, can this make a difference to not only the team that I want to retain, but the team I want to attract? So, right. well, and the other thing I'd say, Paul, there is actually a, there, it's not necessarily why we do it, but there is a commercial aspect to this. And that is that um, if, I, if I was establishing a practice today, I would be building a sustainability assurance practice, hands down. That no one at the moment necessarily, this doesn't necessarily need to be the domain of the big four. Uh, they will certainly provide these services. But, you know, think about an SME who's going to need to provide an assured report at some point. They may not necessarily, with the greatest respect to the big four, have the capacity to go and, and secure those services from them. Um, so why should that not be a service performed by a smaller or medium-sized practice uh, in a uh, in a specialised way? It's, you know, we, we already do assurance services. There's standards around that. There'll be specific standards about sustainability assurance. And I'd be saying, if it was me looking to diversify my practice, mm. I'd be developing a pathway of, of building that sustainability assurance because I, I think you would you'll find that you'll you'd be pretty much first to market. Yeah, I might, might agree. And that's 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 the challenge to, to everyone listening to this is how you start and probably, you know, don't don't wait. There's there's no reason to to wait. It's just a matter of getting on and doing it. So great, great bit of advice there. Mate, um let's let's go into something else we touched on just before and it's probably an important topic to me. Um as I probably continue my probably the last three, four years where I'm doing my little, I'll call it my little one percent to raise awareness in the mental health space. Um, I'm doing a bit of work at the moment with a company called Emotions. And then earlier this year in June, I did the push-up challenge and doing a little bit of work with Movember as well to continually just raise awareness of mental health. And I, you know, so you touched on it before in terms of the practitioners and members are doing it tough. I know you guys were involved in a fairly big program, the Can On You program um, with Deacon. I understand you've got about 4,300 members that have completed the program would that be fair to say yeah so it goes back yeah and, and look hats off to you and the awareness you you raise as well paul i mean we, we've all got a role to play in this and i think the more of us that do it the better um look going back to say four or five years when we we started our process of researching issues in small business we went went around the country and um for our small business white paper which was a, a policy paper we take the government and we, we said to small business owners and members, you know, what's uh, what's the number one issue you face? And they said, oh, well, back then they said, well, the business is going pretty well, um, but we just can't keep working nine days a week. It's not working. And um, uh, we've got our backs against the wall, got no lifestyle, um, really struggling. And we said, well, so who do you turn to? They said, oh, my accountant. I speak to them all the time about it. So it sort of uncovered for us this notion that we hadn't scratched the surface much. I mean, it, these engagements would always go on about small businesses engaging their accountant and talking about issues that went well beyond tax compliance and, and the statutory stuff to actually life. And, yes. and they'd often be confided in. And um, and it, we'd say that to our members saying, you know, so you're sort of like the unofficial counsellor. And they go, well, it happens all the time. You know, you, I often talk about the, um, you know, pushing the shopping trolley down Woolies on a Sunday afternoon and you'd be stopped by a client saying, hey, uh, I mean, I forgot to mention, you know, uh, my you know, partner's now well again through the operation. Da, da, da. And so you're expected to have immediate recall of that client. And that's just what clients expect. Um, and so we thought, well, who's preparing accountants for those conversations? So that was around 2015, 16. We fast forward to 2018 when we started to build our awareness and we did some research into this around the world. Um, I spoke at World Congress of Accountants in 2018 um, about it and put it on the radar. And I was told then, by um, people in the global financial, uh, the global uh, profession, I'll be very careful because this is a taboo topic for many countries. And I said, well, you know, at, at World Congress, we had six and a half thousand accountants in one spot from all over the world. And I said, well, it's a taboo topic because we're not talking about it. And um, so we put on the radar and we, and we actually use real life examples from members 
uh, and, and the anecdotes members gave us about clients who had uh, made an attempt uh, on their life or, or they were really struggling. And, and those stories were really, really harrowing. And we actually put the members' voice to the, the stories. And, and it really, um, you don't have to look too far or speak to too many people around the profession who say, yep, I've got exactly the same scenario. And, and I've had clients in exactly the same boat. So that got us to a point saying, well, we just, we're just not preparing accounts for those conversations. So we partnered with Mental Health First Aid Australia back then to test this concept of running Mental Health First Aid training for accountants. Um, and members jumped at the opportunity to do it. Um, we then used it as sort of proof of concept. We liaised with the Department of Industry federally and Beyond Blue and WorkSafe in Victoria. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know there's a, uh, there'll be certainly plenty of naysayers about the former government uh, and the former prime minister. But to his credit, the P so Scott Morrison came into a meeting we had in Canberra uh, to understand the issue. And he said, I, I think I get it. Well, beyond that meeting, Department of Industry gave $3.2 million to roll out um, training through Deakin University. We formed a program called Counting on You. Um, and that invited the uh, other professional bodies in. We had financial advisors in as well as uh, um, bookkeepers and others come to the table. And that resulted in 4,320 accountants and business advisors being trained in mental health first day wow. across Australia. Um, we were hoping to get to 5,000. That was the target, uh, but we'll take 4320. Um, the, the, the reason why we're really so proud of it, it, it's not about sort of chest thumping about uh, our brand did this. or It was the profession stepping up saying we need to skill up. Yes. And it's not about accountants becoming clinicians. It's not what it's about. But it's really about being that first line when you've got a client sitting opposite you either on Zoom or across from your desk in your office who just crumbles, who do you turn to? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the whole challenge, and we said to the PM at the time, if these funds will result in one person getting access to clinical care sooner than they otherwise would have and putting them on a path to well-being, then surely it's worth it. Yeah. And, and and that's that's really what's happened. And we're so delighted that the other bodies have been so supportive and, and um, we've been able to roll this out. And hats off to Deacon, who this is a world, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. And it's being regarded around the world as um, as a really tremendous program. It was reported, we, we had a research paper published in the, in the, um, uh, the International Journal on Psychiatry about just the impact this can have at a community level. And, and I just think that's such a, um, an endorsement of, of a profession that just says, yeah, the numbers are important, but what we do is actually about people. Correct. Yeah, so well done, mate. Well done. Brilliant. And um, I know we've spoken about that before, but it's great. Is that is that something you, the Institute or the, are they continuing to address that as, as far as it's great that the program's been there, but is yeah. it also something that while the 4,320 you might have mentioned went through it um, yeah. in terms of following up to make sure, you know, if the old scenario, if they're trained in it, how are they using it? Yeah. Look, I think... Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's an ongoing process and we'll keep promoting mental health first. And I mean, I'm really supportive of one of our members, Tony Raba, who set up a, a charity called The Male Hug, which is about actually focusing on men, professional men talking, because there's a significantly higher proportion of professional men represented in, in uh, the statistics around mental ill health. Um, and so The Male Hug's got a thing called Talktober, which has come up, and I've been an ambassador for that as well. It's just encouraging, well, um, yeah, just encouraging guys to talk to one another, which is really important. Uh, so if you're wanting more information, just Google Talktober. But um, the other piece that we've got in this call is that we, um, you know, members said to us, look, it's, it is important for us to have those skills to help clients, but what about us? Mm. Uh, so who do we talk to as accountants and, and advisors? So if we've just been hammered all day from a client from clients who are struggling, who do we download to? So we put in place a service for members. It's free for them. It's called Uprise. It gives them access to half an hour of a clinical consultation with a clinical site. Now, if I was, if you told me, you know, when I first came to this role that we'd be providing psychological services and hotlines to members, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, but it is a really critical service so that members have got someone to call and download to, might be on the way home. Um, so they can walk, they can walk in their door, you know, fresh and, and ready to engage in family life or whatever their, their night brings. So, um, yeah, so they're the sort of services we've put on. So it's not just, uh, you know, it doesn't just stop at the mental health first aid program. Yeah, brilliant. So Uprise. And jump online and have a look at Talktober as well because yeah, I saw exactly. some stuff on you online the other day. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And, and you're right. It's 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 up to us to make sure we're continually raising this awareness. Which you know, you, sometimes you feel like you're not doing enough, and how much more you can do, especially when you hear 
sad story. He was saying that before. He gave me some goosebumps before, just thinking it, it's you just hate to think that you can be in that situation and into that space. Mm. But it happens, and it's um, you know what only happened two weeks ago with Paul Green and yeah, in, you know the rugby league. And, and and that's right. And the best thing you can do is have the conversation. But but equally, you know, the support services that are out there. I mean, Lifeline at 13, 11, 14, if any, you know, they're there for a reason. And it, and, in, and it is a sign of strength, not weakness to make a call. Yeah. And I, I reckon whether it's putting, getting in touch with Lifeline, having a chat, you know, even with the Mail Hub program, which they've got a whole series of buddies that are overseen by um, uh, a, a, a clinician who sort of helps these buddies just have conversations. It's just having that conversation with somebody to say, look, how are you really going? Yes. Um, yeah, it, it could mean all the difference. And it's good again, you know, I talk about the kids driving a lot of things, you know, my 10 year old said to me the other day, he came home with a, I think it was yesterday, came home with a band around his wrist. And he said, oh, by the way, dad, are you okay days on soon? You know, so again, they're, they're coming and telling me about it, which is pretty good. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? And, and, and that's, a, that's the thing as well, whether it's that, whether it's diversity issues, whether it's acceptance of, of people from all race, religion, orientation, the, the, the really pleasing thing is that particularly kids are growing up, they're native to it. Yes. I am native to it. There's no, whereas for others of an older generation are having to be sort of refugees to the conversation. Yes. Um, yeah. So I, I think it'll take time, but yeah, I think sure. uh, the more we have the conversation, the better. And, that, and, and you, know, you know, that's sort of one of the things that drives me, having three boys, and we are in a male-dominated industry, and we're going to talk about yep. gender pay gap in a second. Um, but having three boys, it, it's something that sort of drives me as well, that, you know, my dad would never have shared his feelings. You know, they're just a generation that just never would have done that. Yeah. We're sort of becoming a little bit more, I'm definitely okay with it. As people that know me personally, they know that I wear my heart on my sleeve. So, and yet, so I'm... I'm working with my boys to make a difference in that point of view to make sure that they're, they're okay in talking and sharing their emotions and making sure they're if, if, if you're not okay it's okay just talk about it though so yeah. what you were doing is brilliant yeah absolutely and it is that sense of strength rather than weakness it's it's really mm. important yeah yeah right um let's let's get into another big topic i, I suppose the anz sorry the caanz ceo angela van oslin's been fairly vocal in this space maybe well, maybe two years ago 18 months ago talking about the um the gender pay gap within our industry. Mm. Um, what's your take on this and the approach from the Institute, I suppose? Yeah, look, and and uh, again, all credit to Ainsley for, for uh, taking up his leadership position. I, I think it's a really important um, uh, issue for us to confront and address, and it exists. And, and you know, the data points to around a 27% uh, gap between uh, females and males in accounting in Australia. And patently, that's unacceptable. So on average, that results in about a $50,000 pay gap. Um, yeah, absolutely unacceptable. And it does need to be addressed. But it needs to be addressed, I think, in a range of ways. You know, it, 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 it's, we, we'd like to be able to go bang, here's the solution, and it gets fixed straight away. But then it, we do need to adopt a systemic view uh, in terms of encouraging, you know, a, a focus on, on flexibility. And, and I think in some ways, you know, COVID may have uh, brought about a heightened awareness of uh, what flexibility can mean in a workplace that's no longer sort of shackled by um, being in an office nine to five, five days a week. Um, so there are opportunities now to be engaged in the workforce on a full-time basis, but that could, that will look and does look very different to what it would have looked five years ago. Uh, and, and that's a good thing. So if that encourages greater participation uh, in the workforce, that's, that's a, a start. And I think also just against bringing that awareness, the, the gender pay gap does exist and encouraging businesses to undertake a review. And, and, a, and in some cases, that could be an external review to just see how are their uh, pay scales lined up, where are the gaps and what needs to be done to address them. So I'd say the first step is really to, to try and diagnose specifically the, the issue within each business and then work through progressively about making changes around um, you know, hiring practices, the way in which um, candidates are being sought, what sort of net is being cast in terms of the, the skills and requirements that are being uh, called for in each role. So it's 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 not an easy uh, topic to get a simple. There's no simple solution to it. No, no. But, but but again, I think when when you engage with your team and talk to them about it, you'll get some really interesting approaches and responses. Sometimes you know, I've found as well. Sometimes it can be the perception of a gender pay gap, but 
I just go open book on that in a sense and using aggregates in, in a business and say, well, here, here are the facts. Here's where we're at. Yes. Um, and, and here's what we need to try and do to address it. So, yeah, I, I think we just need to be aware and that starting point is an acceptance that across the profession, we have a significant gap of 27%. And I think by any standard, that's unacceptable. Mm. I saw some stats only maybe last week or the week before even come out that that, that was closing, which was, in, which, which was interesting. And, you know, I even obviously the guys at Hall Chadwick, the first thing when I obviously started to talk about this and they were, oh, we don't have that or, you know, we definitely don't have that across our boards with all of our partners. So mm. it was actually really good to even raise it and get some feedback from the guys at Hall Chadwick to say, well, and they were very good. So no, that doesn't happen within our firm, but it does happen within obviously other firms. Well, and you've seen some trends as well uh, in, in the profession where now it was one of the big four um, uh, publish their pay scales. Um, I think it was relatively, it might've been PwC. That's one PwC, of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty bold move. But the challenge is, of course, is that um, it, it, businesses can sometimes be lulled into a false sense of security because they look at the the the, the gender uh, split across their um, uh, their organisation and say, well, we're, we're sort of well balanced. We've got, you know, we might have pretty well 50-50 uh, males to females across uh, across the business that might be great but taking the next level and saying all right what does that mean in terms of pace you know pay rates mm -hmm. and and being willing because of course salaries generally um are, are those things that businesses and business and, and managers will hold very close to their chest and say well right. you know from a confidential point of view and that's always used i mean most employment contracts will have the confidentiality clause that you can't divulge your salary to anyone in the organization or else it's a breach of contract so we we, we design our contracts around um confidentiality and, and probably with good reason um but we've got to find ways of, of, of enabling that analysis to say well how are we actually tracking and being very transparent with your team saying yep if we've got a problem we we acknowledge the problem and we're going to work on on fixing it and then engaging very well with your hr team to actually look at the the recruitment practices and, and the way in which you're, you're recruiting talent and also doing their market analysis of what's happening out there as well yeah, good. And that's, that's a great part about it, I suppose. There's so much data out there at the moment where people are, like a PwC, that have been so open about their, their data. It's actually good that it helps other firms that are a lot smaller than PwC's that they, they, can, they can adopt that sort of same mindset and that theory if that's what they want to do. But you're right. Unfortunately, it's in the contract, isn't it? So yeah. you're already starting with, you're a step behind. I think, I think as well, it comes down to really good employment practices. So you know, if if you, one of the challenges is is some people have been in roles for some time in organisations, and so there's a sense of oh well, the PD was set up when they came into the role, and that's been that place in place for ten plus years. But you know, good practices is really looking at revising PDs very regularly, looking at the performance management process and planning, um, development plans, and so forth. And you're having genuine. I mean, in our organisation, we do it once every six months. We'll walk through. And go sort of a top to toe review of the of the role and how the person's um, uh, working in that role and what we need to do to support them, um, because that then gives you a good baseline of comparative data that you can say what right, right if you've got two roles side by side one performed by a male one performed by a female if they are largely the same by way of PD and task that gives you the baseline to say well why are they not remunerated the same yeah. Um, if you don't have that information about the, the, the role descriptors and, and, and good HR practices to start with, you're on pretty shaky ground. And I don't need, you don't need to tell practitioners or members in the profession at the moment, it is a really tight employment market. Yeah. And that if you are not demonstrating good, good HR practices in, in your practice, um, your employees will go elsewhere and go elsewhere really quickly, um, perhaps even before they even trigger a conversation on gender pay gap. So I just I think it's just a wake up call for us all about making sure we are um, well and truly across our obligations as managers and employers, and and really practicing good HR management um, to avoid some of these issues because they it, it, you know they're just not well they're fundamentally just not fair to staff to be having to have those conversations. I think the minute a staff member comes forward and say oh, I think we've got a gender pay gap issue, it, it should have been the manager to determine that and and fix it. Spot on, spot on. It's a good little segue again. This is good. It's working well. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about the people challenge because, you know, there's no doubt there is a lack of people in our industry now, whether that's been forced by some of the stuff with COVID or, um, and I know the, you know, like a, 
a support of ours, you know, sort of profit master, which is an over an offshore provider. Mm. You know, obviously those companies are going crazy at the moment, which is fantastic. But mm. we know we've got a lack of people here that's forcing wages up. Even on Tuesday at our lunch, you know, I got into a conversation about people um, sort of leaving one firm for another firm for five or ten thousand dollars, which is not a lot of money when you think about the the cost of losing that people and retraining and then trying to hire again. Mm. Um, and, and probably with those costs rising, you know, I don't know if, if, even if the firms can even pass those costs on. How do you see this, let's call it the solution? I know you've touched on a couple of things for everyone watching today, but how do you see the solution to the people problem at the moment? Uh, again, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a short, well, it's going to be a medium term solution, I think. We'd love to be able to click the fingers and say, job done. Mm -hmm. The government, in a way, just last week, have announced they're going to be increasing the skilled migration intake levels. Um, that will take some time to, to flow through. Um, the, uh, I think in a sense, we have to be, we're going to look at the expectation, what I call the expectation gap in a sense. And when I speak to practitioners, they say, well, I want a graduate who on, after I've shown them where the emergency exits are uh, on day one and uh, given them broad orientation on day two, I want to put them in front of a client. Now that's never been the case in the profession. We've never been able to do that. Um, but there is a really strong focus on practitioners just saying, I think the, the fundamental point is they're not really getting from the education system, the, the output, the, the quality of graduate they're expecting or they're wanting. So that there's, a, there's a misalignment in terms of what employers are wanting and what the education system is serving up. Now there's a role there for professional bodies to step in and try and bridge that. But I think, I think we have to, as employers, develop a broader mindset to say, right, how, how, do I, how can I train um, the you know, graduates in to try and build that skills, that those skills from within the practice. I, I think we also have a role at the other end of the spectrum to say, how do we hold on to the knowledge that's in the profession and what pathways can we provide for experienced practitioners to come back in and, and to use their skills and resources um, in, in much the same way in the education space and schools, um, retired teachers are being encouraged to come back in to help uh, with the, the shortage of teachers. How do we encourage holding on to those professionals that have been in practice for some time or got you know, massive masses of experience? How do we keep that in the profession? So one of the things we introduced was a thing called a retired platinum category of member. And that would enable a member to, they could hang up the practice certificate, but we could keep providing services for a fee and we give them uh, a restricted uh, form of professional indemnity insurance, for, for example, so they can keep in the profession. And that's at a, at a massively reduced price. Now, that's one way of trying to keep practitioners in the system. But the other thing Paul Hank wanted to do is have really genuine, robust conversations with educators about what we're getting. And I don't think, I, I think we're at a, at a flexion point now where as a profession, we need to change the mindset around education so that we're not shackled to what was once, you know, go and do your, you know, you do your, your, your HSC or VCE, you get your know, year 11, year 12 course, you then go to tertiary studies, you do then a PY, you do your professional program on top of that and bang, three or four years later, you're able to go into, into the profession. The amount of knowledge that's available at the moment, and I'll, some might know I started my career in education, dabbled in academia since, that the, the amount of knowledge that's available at your fingertips right now is so vast. And we, we have, as a profession, we have struggled to provide a mechanism to codify that or to certify it. So I think we're rapidly getting to a point where it won't be long before uh, we get a professional body that says, of all of these qualifications and certifications around the world and all these competencies, if you lasso these, you meet the requirements. And, and uh, you know, there are thousands, tens of thousands of these things around the world. Um, why aren't we developing more of a, an integrated, innovative mindset about pathways? And so, yes, we'll still have the traditional pathways through universities and, and that they will be there. But if we wait for universities to change, we'll be waiting forever more. And right. my fear is that we'll still be teaching consolidations in 30 or 40 years time in the same way we're teaching them today. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it's, I, I don't have that silver bullet to say, here's, here's the, the solution to skill shortage. I fundamentally believe we're going to be thinking about broadening our remit, broadening our focus and pipelines into the profession so you might have the, the one exit point 
but a whole range of pathways that cross over and overlap and do loops and all sorts of stuff, but take you into that one, one exit point. Um, and, and practices are doing this themselves already. So they, they're recruiting to um, competency, they're recruiting to certain, you know, engineers, science, data anal analysts are coming in. People who have never done one day of debits and credits are being appointed by accounting firms and they're being trained up on the technical. I, I think the profession's got to move rapidly and get there very quickly to, to hold on to its relevance. Yeah, mm, interesting, good, good. Very interesting points of view, which is, which is always refreshing, I think as well. Every time I talk to you, I actually quite, um, your, your knowledge, your background, the, and also the, the stuff you're doing overseas as well always intrigues me a little bit. And it, it's adds so many layers to obviously people that are in the profession. Now, again, I'm an educator, I'm not actually a partner in a firm. So it always triggers me to certain things that firms could start doing. And I think that's the great thing about this. That's what we're doing today. Yeah, I, think the, I think the interesting one, there's been a lot of conversation um, online about, you know, what role should professional bodies have with international partnerships and agreements and so forth. And I get it because there's a bit of a role, the eye factor, and it's just, oh, is, this the, is this just an opportunity for CEOs to either get on the, the plane again and sign great agreements and have a photo yeah. and back on the plane. The reality is, of course, we operate in a global profession. And our approach has been, we've got our uh, operations in, um, so beyond the UK, we've got operations in China, so an office in Beijing, an office in KL, and then some um, satellite offices in uh, Hong Kong um, and Shanghai and, and other places throughout Southeast Asia. Um, but we took a deliberate move around building partnerships with um, within the South Pacific and broadly Southeast Asia. But our approach is really twofold. One is blatantly hand up member growth, but that you know, there's an opportunity there to look at comparator organisations that yep, we're comfortable with the quality and we can provide member growth pathway. So that's just the shameless uh, marketing promotion side. But the other perhaps most important element is the public interest side. So the example I give you is we signed an, an agreement with the Institute of, um, uh, of Solomon Islands uh, accountants. Um, so the Solomon Islands had, does not have a professional program of accounting. They could not find someone to do it for them um, at, at the level they wanted it at. And so we partnered with uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia, who provided the funding to actually develop this program. And so we now provide that through Monarch Education in Australia, an introductory course in accounting for, for the Solomons. Now, why is that important? You know, there are min hundreds of millions of dollars of aid that roll through the Solomon Islands that needs to be accounted for properly. And so DFAT said, well, we're really keen to see that done. And we, we need people who are trained up and understand debits and credits, the basis of double entry. And that's really the focus of the course. And so it's the start of um, their profession that emerges yes. in the Solomon Islands. Now, we don't make money out of that. We don't make member growth out of it, but it's the right thing to do for us to help out a neighbouring uh, professional body who's just burgeoning and trying to get themselves off the ground. So I think to those naysayers, say, oh, well, I don't get it. I understand the cynicism, but we are part of a global profession and we do have obligations to help those. And certainly where Australia has interests uh, in aid and other for other reasons, we're very happy to help. So um, yeah, it, it is, it, it's really interesting. And again, it's not something that people beyond the profession think too much no. about. Yeah. Um, but, but it does present huge opportunity for students as well going forward. Yeah, brilliant. But, um, and just everyone watching this, throw any comments you've got to anything we've spoken about to date. I know we're going on 12.50, but just chuck anything in there. If you want to question anything that, or throw a question to Andrew, sorry, throw it in there into the Q&A and I'll sort of monitor that soon. Um, mate, probably in that last probably five, seven minutes or so, I just want to, jump through a few little quick things that you may want to share with us. And I suppose all of us that sort of run businesses or are in these roles as CEOs or partners of businesses, we tend to be probably more control freaks. Um, and, you know, I've become better at that sort of thing. <laughs> but what's your advice on delegation? What, what's the best way to learn how to delegate? I know, there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of practices that still struggle with this. That's the, hence, hence the question. Oh, look, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a challenge in terms of um, certainly you've been close to building something up. You know, there's that sense of this is my baby. I want to hold on to it. But it's about realising that not it, it's a win-win situation in the sense, in the sense, you know, you, you're going to have something off your desk or off your plate that, you know, you're going to have a bit more free time to think maybe more strategically about your business and, and look at those growth opportunities rather than being in the, the, the cut and thrust of decision making. But also it's a huge development opportunity for your team as well. 
And so I, I do say to our team pretty insistently that, um, and it's a, I mean, others use the mantra, I'm sure, but you'll always back someone who's made a call rather than someone who doesn't. And and so what you're backing there is is the person using their in, their insight. So so we one of the things I have practiced since day one was this notion that's and if I had someone from our team on on the call, they'd be saying, I reckon I know what he's going to say. It, 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 it's uh, instincts. You know, you, you get instincts important, but but you got to rely on insight over instinct every day of the week. So if you can, if you can, if somebody says, oh, I think we should do this, my response generally is, we'll come back when you know. Um, and um, that doesn't mean you ignore your instincts, but you've got to have that insight level. So if you've got access to information, access to the data, you, you can do your own analysis, you can come up with an objective view and you make a decision based on that insight. Then, then you know that's great, and that's why you can have the confidence in delegation. So I think it's really, delegation is fundamental to development, both for you, uh, but I think also for your team. Yeah, and I, and I think you, you're right because a lot of people sometimes turn around and say, "Oh, look, by the time I need to train, and by the time I need to follow up, by the, I should have just done it myself." Yep. Uh, that that's not always the right answer. But, but all that happens is, is you push that down further and further, and so the time that you're going to need to delegate. Um, it, it, it will ultimately make that harder in due course. So you're better off just trying to find a way to facilitate that and just get on with it. Yeah, good, good. But any um, any daily rituals that you have that you can share or you wish to share that? No, well, I um, you want to give a bit of a result as well. Yeah. So I um, so with the team, I we we have a um, a huddle, just a thirty minute catch up huddle, which is no set agenda. It's just catching up with the uh, group executive. Um, just to shoot the breeze, what's going on? What do they need some guidance on, or what what are they working on? Um, I have a uh, a really fundamental sort of hour long uh, slot in the diary first thing in the morning with my EA to work through emails and priorities, which is uh, which, which is actually a, a godsend in a, in a way because it keeps the wheels turning, yes. um, so things don't jam up. From a personal point of view, I, I set myself a target going back to mental health and well being of um, I I do try and exercise once a day um, and, and that I'll try and grab an hour um, at some point. And that goes back to, uh, I was put flat on my back um, around 10 years ago, a bit more now actually, where I did a really, had a really bad back injury. Um, and so I was laid up for quite some time where all three lumbar discs were completely uh, dislodged and dislocated or prolapsed. And, um, and uh, it was a function of carrying too much weight. And I was, smacked around the chops by a really blunt neurosurgeon who just said um i can operate or you can just lose weight and uh so it was a big wake up call and a kick in the pants and so uh ever since then i've um gone down the path from that point to now sort of dropped around 45 kgs and i've tried to hold it off which is uh which is good um and my wife uh she didn't need to but she went on the same journey as well and and so we sort of developed that sort of cha complete change of lifestyle and to the point where just a, a month or two ago, I was, well, I was pretty happy patting myself on the back by knocking off a half marathon, which was a bit of fun. So, so my, my, I'll, I'll try and do 5K. You go for a 5K jog or run a day. And, um, yeah. 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 Fantastic. Oh, absolutely. And I think that was one of the great things, you know, it came to June last year and I think we'd just gone into lockdown. Yeah. And um, someone through LinkedIn invited me to join this push-up challenge. And man, I couldn't even do 10 push-ups. <laughs> And then suddenly they're wanting me to do 3,139 or something. And that's all relevant. It's a, lazy, it's a lazy day, Paul. Yeah, exactly. And just so everyone knows, that's, that, that number is all relevant to the amount of suicides. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a ridiculous number that we need to do. So me doing an average of 140 push-ups a day. And the great part was doing it with the kids. You know, my, my six-year-old was getting involved, you know, doing crazy stuff and it was it, it leads to a different mental health outcome and you know, again um yeah are you sore absolutely but you know it's nothing in comparison to what other people may be going through so it was a it was a it was an easy thing to do at the end of the day and raise some money at the same time no well done. Um, mate, mate what about um when, when it comes to let's say mentors or coaches what, what's what's something is that something you you encourage you have yeah, I don't, I don't have a formal mentor per se, but I've been really fortunate with some really engaged chairs of the board. Um, a former chair of a board I was on um, uh, is, is really good contact. I don't really catch up with her as, as much as I probably would like to. Um, and also some former colleagues in the profession who I'll catch up with. So I've sort of got a spread of people I'll, I'll just go and shoot the breeze with and just have a chat in, in terms of where things are at. 
Um, so yeah, I, I particularly say those former chairs of our board have been very supportive and mentoring, and uh, but I, I don't really have a formal mentorship in a process in place. Okay. Okay, and I might um, throw to some questions given the, I sort of had a quick look down and I went, oh, there's some questions. So apologies to everyone there that's sort of throwing them in there. Um, I'll go to the first one. And I haven't looked at these, so I'm just gonna read them out. So hopefully they're good. Does it need to be con a conscious thing that an organization actively engages in, i.e. quotes, et cetera, yeah. or can it just be genuinely employing the best candidate? Yeah, look, I think the notion of quotas, I mean, quotas certainly have their critics. I think we're past the point of saying, oh, should, should we have quotas or not? I think ultimately it's about what's going to lead to the outcome of getting A, the best possible person, but also shifting the dial at the same time on getting that balance in the workplace. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I think if, if the conversation is, oh, we shouldn't have a quota because that's unfair, uh, what's also unfair is the fact that we, have, we don't have equal opportunity. So mm -hmm. I think you, you, you've got to uh, sort of bite the bullet and say, let's actually try and get some change and ultimately if, you, if a quota is going to get you there then uh, maybe it's worth exploring for your business yeah okay well said man there's, 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 there's a good one here on sort of mental health uh, mental health is difficult to tackle with work colleagues mm. we had an issue in the past of identifying an employee that we could see was down we asked her and tried to discuss issues with her but she dismissed us mm. we could see problems persisting but were lost as to where to turn to next mm. so so there's a couple of things there in terms of, you know, not every business is going to have access to an employee assistance program. Um, but if you've had people that have trained in mental health first aid, there are ways you, you, that you can ask the questions. There are specific techniques you can use. So my encouragement would be if in that situation, if we just assume for a moment that the business doesn't have a person who's trained in mental health first aid, of actually encouraging uh, that to be done, because that can give you the skills uh, to have the conversation. Ultimately, if a person continues to dismiss you and doesn't engage, fundamentally, that's their choice. Like, so you, you can't, it, it's, um, you go and do some John's Ambulance first aid course and somebody refuses treatment, fundamentally, that's their right to do that. Yeah. Um, so you've got the obligation of the employer to, to educate, to say, look, we're happy, here, we're here to help, we're happy to help. But if somebody rejects the help, well, that's actually, that is their call. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because, because there's, that, there's that element of, no one wants to admit that they may have a problem, but we can, and as leaders, we could probably identify behaviours that is leading to that. And that's always an interesting factor, isn't it? And um, to anyone listening to this as well, my, my previous guest was Daniel Spitty from Everperform. So they've got some pretty cool software that they work with as well to identify well-being. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's a series of questions that you can ask. So it's worth even just looking to that and that might help as well. Yeah. Um, Kate's got a question here. Andrew, what exactly are you sharing with your team, Ari, gender pay gap to demonstrate there is no issue? Well, we, we, well the first thing we said is we're not, uh, we're not making the statement that we, that we don't have an issue. We're, we're happy to explore it if we, and identify if we do. And, and so we, we said we're doing a review of our, um, so we've got about 77% of our staff are female. Um, so we are we're working through that with the team as well and just putting it on the table saying we're keen to explore it. We want to understand and make sure that we don't have uh, a, a gender pay gap and we'll do the analysis. So once we've got the reporting done, uh, we'll be sharing it with, that, with our team, even at a team meeting, at a staff meeting in an open forum. So sort of town hall style. If we adopted a, a thing called a leadership charter, which has four pillars of talking directly, um, listening first, building accountability and building psychological safety for our three, uh, four things that we expect in leaders. And so the team hold me accountable for that. And so in this aspect of gender pay gap is an area that we put on the table and say, right, if you think there's an issue, let's explore it. We're going to have a look ourselves to see, and then we'll bring it together and see uh, yeah, whether we whether we do and what we can do about it together. Okay. It's another one from Kate here as well. What do you think we need to advocate for as an industry to mm. state or federal government for the ease of doing business? So one of the big things, Kate, is that I've got on my uh, to-do list is to be advocating to government for a thing called a small business administration. Now, the US, uh, there's probably a whole other topic for another day, Paul, but the US set one up um, post-World War II, and that was designed to bring a central government agency approach to small business regulation. So if you need access to small business advice, disaster recovery, so, so for example, to get access to COVID support grants, Rather than going to every different state government agency to apply for the grants, you go to one stop. 
it is it is one point of contact. It's the one set of integrity measures, um, and and that makes the life of small business so much easier. In, in the US, the SBA is actually also a lender of last resort. Um, so if small businesses might not meet the risk profile of a bank, they can actually access funding to get their business off the ground through the SBA. And the default rates are about 8% lower the market as well, which is interesting. So, so SBA is, is a critical point of advocacy where we're leading with. We've got the research brewing at the moment. We're working with the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman and Julie Collins, the new small business minister as well, um, <clears throat> to bring that one up. Because I, I think it... it we think about how Australia is going to recover from its net debt position that's forecast to peak at $980 billion in 24-25. Productivity is one of the keys and you've got to get out of the way of small business. We think an SBA, which would remove the requirement of all the state and territory-based small business regulators and put in one stop, uh, one stop shop, I think is one, just one point that we could make life easier for small business. Okay, brilliant. Well, mate, thank you. Um, it's just gone 102, so I'm just conscious of your time because I know that you always give up your time for us and I certainly appreciate. So thank you very much, mate, for joining us today. Um, I, I always, as I said before, I, I really enjoy chatting to you, whether it's our coffees that we cap up for very quickly in the city or whether it's on these sessions where we chat to each other. So thank you again for, one, your time, your openness, your honestness. Um, I just, I just really enjoyed it. So hopefully all of you that have joined us as well have enjoyed listening to Andrew Conway. So thank you very much, mate. Thanks, Paul. And I just posted for those uh, uh, involved in it. Thanks for, for attending. I'll put my contact details in the chat, including my mobile number. If something comes up, someone wants to discuss at any time, please feel free. Uh, but Paul, thanks for the conversation and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. Magnificent. Thanks again. To all of you that are still online, um, look out for my next Women in Accounting show. It's something that we brought new to this year again to highlight females doing great things in the industry and i'm chatting to a wonderful practitioner here in melbourne next thursday so it's the 25th of getting my dates confused and we're talking about personal branding we're talking about social branding we're talking about marketing and what she's done to change the way her approach to bringing in new clientele and the type of clients that she wanted so look out for that invitation hopefully you can join us next week otherwise thanks again andrew and signing off till i see you next time